Hello everyone and welcome back. I can't believe the support from the wire community. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and I hope what I'm teaching here is helpful. What I'm reading is interesting. Yeah, I, please. I, w I would like you know, some recommendations. If something, anything. I'll look it up on Wikipedia. I'll read it. Leave it in the comments. I'm very excited for this episode because you know, people ask me, Letha, what's your favorite stone? You know. And I like a lot of different stones. Actually, I love all rocks. I think they're all interesting, and they all have their own stories. But my absolute favorites are fossils. Any kind of fossils doesn't matter. You know what the stone is that they're made out of. I just, I just love fossils. I love you know, the ancient history, the idea of you know, holding something in my hands that you know, was around and alive millions of years ago. It's just, it amazes me. So today we're going to be wrapping in this amazing ammonite fossil. Like I said, I love fossils. And yeah, every ammonite is unique and wonderful and beautiful and amazing and was in the ocean swimming around so, so long ago. So long ago. Sorry, I'm just... It amazes me. And I love it. It's a very simple wrap and I really... I think I started out designing it for ammonites, but it works for yeah, anything that has a sloped back where the, the front is flat and the, the back sticks out. So yeah, I've used it on agate slices that are angled towards the back on the sides, and you know, it works great, holds everything tight. The, um, the ammonite I'm using in this video has a drill hole at the point of it. But I don't put anything through the drill hole. This is entirely it's entirely held in by the setting. And, you know, it looks like it shouldn't be. <laughs> it looks like magic. But it works, trust me. The Wikipedia article we're reading today is called Aminoidea, which I hope I'm pronouncing right. And I'm going to... There's a bunch of parts in this I'm going to skip because I've realized that I don't speak Latin. But then again, nobody speaks Latin, so hey, there's that. Gonna skip about the orders and suborders and families and all the crazy words that I mispronounced. So, let's get started. Aminoidea. Aminoids are a group of extinct marine mollusk animals in the subclass Aminoidea of the class of Cephalopoda. These mollusks, commonly referred to as ammonites, are more closely related to living coleoids. Octopuses, squids, cuttlefish, that sort of thing. Then they are to shelled nautiloids, such as the living nautilus species. The earliest ammonites appeared during the Devonian, and the last species either vanished in the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event or shortly after during the Danian epoch of Paleocene. Ammonites are excellent index fossils in linking the lock layers in which particular species or genus is found to specific geological time periods is often possible. Oh, that's awesome. They can use ammonites to tell how old rocks are. The different ammonites you know, evolve in different ways. Their fossil shells usually take the form of planispirals, although some helically spiraled, non-spiraled forms, known as heteromorphs, have been found. The name ammonite, from which the scientific term is derived, was inspired by the spiral shape of their fossil shells, which somewhat resembles tightly coiled ram's horns. Pliny the Elder called the fossils of these animals Ammonis Komura, horns of Amon, because the Egyptian god Amon, or Amun, was typically depicted wearing ram's horns. Often the name of the Ammonite genus ends in Ceres, which is Greek for horn. I'm going to skip down this article right to the life. Because ammonites and their close relatives are extinct, little is known about their way of life. Their soft body parts are very rarely preserved in any detail. Nonetheless, much has been worked out by examining ammonoid shells and by using models of these shells in water tanks. Many ammonoids probably lived in the open water and ancient seas rather than at the sea bottom because their fossils are often found in rocks laid down under conditions where no bottom dwelling life is found. Many of them, are thought to have been good swimmers, with flattened, discus-shaped, streamlined shells, although some ammonoids were less effective swimmers and were likely to have been slow-swimming bottom dwellers. Synchrotron analysis of an aptocropron 
ammonite revealed remains of isopod and mollusk larvae in its buccal cavity, indicating at least this kind of ammonite fed on plankton. They may have avoided predation by squirting ink, much like modern cephalopods. Ink is occasionally preserved in fossil specimens. The soft body of the creature occupied the largest segment of the shell at the end of the coil. The smaller earlier segments were walled off and the animal could maintain its buoyancy by filling them with gas. Thus the smaller sections of the coil would have floated above the larger sections. Many ammonite shells have been found with round holes once interpreted as a result of limpets attaching themselves to the shells. However, the triangular formation of the holes, their size and shape, and their presence on both sides of the shells corresponding to the upper and lower jaws is more likely evidence of a bite of a medium-sized mosasaur preying upon ammonites. Some ammonites appear to have lived in cold seeps and even reproduced there. Shell anatomy and diversity. Now there's a lot of words here I'm probably going to mispronounce. Basic shell anatomy. The chambered part of the ammonite shell is called the phragmacone. It contains a series of progressively larger chambers called chimerae. What are divided by that are divided by thin walls called septa. Only the last and largest chamber, the body chamber, was occupied by the living animal at any given moment. As it grew, it added newer and larger chambers to open to the open end of the coil, where the outer whorl of an ammonite shell largely covers the preceding whorls. The specimen is said to be involute. Where it does not cover those preceding, the specimen is said to be evolute. A thin living tube called a siphuncle passed through the septa, extending from the ammonite's body into the empty shell chambers. Through hypersomatic active transport process, the ammonite emptied water out of these shell chambers. This enabled it to control the buoyancy of the shell and thereby rise and descend in the water column. A primary difference between ammonites and nautiloids is that the siphuncle of ammonites runs along the ventral periphery of the septa and chimera, the inner surface and outer axis of the shell, while the siphuncle of nautiloids runs more or less through the center of the septa and chimera. Sexual dimorphism. One feature found in shells of the modern nautilus is the variation in the shape and size of the shell according to the sex of the animal, the shell of the male being slightly smaller and wider than that of the female. This sexual dimorphism is thought to be an explanation for the variations in size of certain ammonite shells of the same species, the larger shell being female and the smaller shell being male. This is thought to be because of the female required the larger body size for egg production. A good example of this sexual variation is found in Bifraceras from the early part of the Jurassic period of Europe. Only recently has sexual variation in the shells of ammonites been recognized. The macroconch and microconch of one species were often previously mistaken for two closely related but different species occurring in the same rocks. However, because of the dimorphic size are so consistently found together, they are more likely an example of sexual dimorphism within the same species. Whorl width in the body chamber of many groups of ammonites is expressed by the width-diameter ratio as another sign of dimorphism. The characters character has been used to separate male from female. Variations in shape. The majority of ammonite species feature plantae spiral flat coiled shells, but other species feature nearly straight shells. Still other species shells are coiled helically, similar in appearance to some gastropods. Some species cells are even initially uncoiled, then partially coiled, and finally straight at maturity. These partially uncoiled and totally uncoiled forms began to diversify mainly during the early part of the Cretaceous and are known as heteromorphs. Perhaps the most extreme and bizarre looking example of a heteromorph is nip niponites, which appears to be a tangle of irregular whorls lacking any obvious symmetric coiling. Upon closer inspection, though, the shell proves to be a three-dimensional network of connected U-shapes. Nipotines occurs in rocks of the upper part of the Cretaceous in Japan and the United States. Ammonites vary greatly in the ornamentation of their shells. 
Some may be smooth and relatively featureless, except for growth lines, and resemble that of a modern nautilus, and others various patterns and spiral ridges and ribs, or, and even spines are shown. This type of ornamentation of the shell is especially evident in the later ammonites of the Cretaceous. Apt Apticus. Some ammonites have been found in association with a single horny plate or a pair of calcitic plates. In the past, these plates were assumed to serve in closing and opening of the shell in much the same way as an operculum. operculum. But more recently, they are postulated to have been a jaw apparatus. The plates are collectively termed the apticus or aptici in the case of a pair of plates. The anicyptus is a case of a single plate. The paired aptici were symmetric to one another and equal in size and appearance. Anaptici are relatively rare as fossils. They are found representing ammonites from the Devonian period through those of the Cretaceous period. Calcified aptici only occur in ammonites from the Mesozoic era. They are almost always found detached from the shell and are only very rarely preserved in place. Still sufficient numbers have been found closing the apertures of fossils ammonite shells to leave no doubt as to their identity as part of the anatomy of an ammonite. Large numbers of detached aptici occur in certain beds of rocks, such as those from the Mesozoic and the Alps. These rocks are usually accumulated at great depths. The modern nautilus lacks any calcitic plate for closing its shell, and only one extant nautilite genus is known to have borne anything similar. Nautilus does, however, have a leathery head shield, the hood, in which it uses to cover the opening when it retreats inside. There are many forms of apticus, varying in shape and the sculpture of the inner and outer surfaces, but because they are so rarely found in position within the shell of the ammonite, it is often unclear to which species of ammonite one kind of apticus belongs. A number of aptici have been given their own genus and even species names independent of their own known owner's genus and species, pending future discovery of verified occurrences within the ammonite shells. Soft part anatomy. Although ammonites do occur in exceptional largest stratum such as the Solenford limestone, their soft part record is surprisingly bleak. Beyond a tentative ink sac and the possible digestive organs, no soft parts were known until 2021. They likely bore a rabula and beak and marginal spunkle and ten arms. Ten arms. They operated by direct development with sexual reproduction, were carnivorous, and had a crop for food storage. They are unlikely to have dwelt in fresh or brackish water. Many ammonites were likely filter feeders, so adaptations associated with this lifestyle, like sieves, probably occurred. A 2021 study found ammonite specimens that were preserved hooked like suckers, providing a general shape to ammonite tentacles. A contemporary study found an ammonite isolated body, offering for the first time a glimpse into these animals' organs. Size Few of the ammonites occurring in the lower and middle part of the Jurassic period reach in size exceeding 23 centimeters, 9.1 inches in diameter. Much larger forms are found in later rocks at the upper part of the Jurassic and lower part of the Cretaceous, such as titanites from the Portland Stone of Jurassic of South England, which often which is often 53 centimeters, 1.74 feet in diameter. A Parapsozoas seperendensis of the Cretaceous period of Germany, which is one of the largest known ammonites, sometimes reaching 2 meters, 6.6 .6 feet in diameter. 6.6 .6 feet, you want to put some wire on that. The largest documented North American ammonite is Parapsozoa bridaea from the Cretaceous, with the specimen measuring 137 centimeters, or 4.5 feet in diameter. Distribution Starting from the mid-Devonian, ammonoids were extremely abundant, especially as ammonites during the Mesozoic era. Many genera evolved and ran their course quickly, becoming extinct in a few million years. Due to their rapid evolution and widespread distribution, ammonoids are used by geologists and paleontologists for biostratigraphy. They are excellent index fossils. They already said that up high. And it is often possible to link rock, rock layers 
in which they are found to specific geologic time periods. Due to their free-swimming or free-floating habits, ammonites often happen to live directly above seafloor waters so poor in oxygen as to prevent the establishment of animal life on the seafloor. When upon death, the ammonites fell to the seafloor and were gradually buried in accumulating sediment. Bacterial decomposition of these corpses often tipped the delicate balance of local redox conditions, sufficiently to lower the local solubility of minerals dissolved in the seawater notably phosphates and carbonates, the resulting spontaneous concentric precipitation of minerals around a fossil, a concretion, is responsible for the outstanding preservation of many ammonite fossils. When ammonites are found in clays, their original mother-of-pearl coating is often preserved. This type of reservation is found in ammonites such as hoplites from the Cretaceous galt clay of Folkestone in Kent, England. The Cretaceous Pierre Shale Formation in the United States and Canada is well known for the abundant ammonite fauna it yields, including bacillites, placentaceras, scaphalites, haplocephalites, and gelesicites. I'm sure I pronounced all of those wrong, as well as many uncoiled forms. Many of these also have much or all of their original shell, as well as the complete body chamber still intact. Many Pierre Shale ammonites, and indeed many ammonites throughout Earth history, are found inside concretions. Other fossils, such as many found in Madagascar and Alberta, Canada, display iridescent. These iridescent ammonites are often of gem quality. We know them as amylite. In no case would this iridescence have been visible during the animal's life. Additional shell layers covered it. Um, but this particular wrap that we're doing, also I like the open back because a lot of times you have the backs of these uh, ammonites have a shimmery or a rainbowy, or I have one that has a red back and one that has a very rainbowy back, and they all seem to have you know, something a little interesting going on on their backs. The majority of ammonoid specimens, especially those of the Paleozoic era, are preserved only as internal molds, the outer shell composed of, composed of aragonite has been lost during the fossilization process. Only in these internal mold specimens can the suture lines be observed. In life, the sutures would have been hidden by the outer shell. The ammonoids as a group continue through several major extinction events, although often only a few species survive. Each time, however, this handful of species diversified into a multitude of forms. Ammonite fossils became less abundant during the later part of the Mesozoic, and although they seemingly survived the Cretaceous and Paleogene extinction event, all known Paleocene ammonite lineages are restricted to the Danian period, 65 to 61 million years ago. Evolutionary History Goniotites, which were a dominant component of early and middle Permian faunas, became rare in the late Permian, and no goniotite is thought to have crossed into the Triassic. Keratidida mm -hmm. no. originated during the Middle Permian, likely from the Deralatidae, and radiated in the Late Permian. In the aftermath of the Permian Triassic extinction event, Ceratidids represent the dominant group of Triassic ammonites. Ammonites were devastated by the end Triassic extinction with only a handful of genera belonging to the family Siloceratidae of the suborder Phyloceratina surviving and becoming ancestral to all later Jurassic and Cretaceous ammonites. Ammonites explosively diversified during the early Jurassic with the orders Siloceratina, Ammonitatina, Lytoceratina, Haploceratina, Parasphinctatina, and Siloceratina, all appearing during the Jurassic. Heteromorph ammonites, ammonites with open or non spiral co coiling of the order Ankyloceratina, became common during the Cretaceous period. The extinction of ammonites, along with other marine animals and non avian dinosaurs, has been attributed to the KPG extinction event, making the end of the Cretaceous period. Eight or so species from only two families made it almost to the end of the Cretaceous, the order having gone through more or less steady decline since the middle of the period. 
Six other families made it well into the upper Maastrician, upper most of the Cretaceous, but were extinct well before the end. All told, 11 families entered Massatrician, a decline from the 19 families known from the Cenomonian in the middle of the Cretaceous. One reason given for their demise is the Cretaceous Ammonites, being closely related to the colloids, had a similar reproductive strategy in which huge numbers of eggs were laid on a single batch at the end of a lifespan. These, along with juvenile ammonites, are thought to have been part of the plankton at the surface of the ocean, where they were killed off by the effects of an impact. Nautiloids, exemplified by modern nautiluses, are conversely thought to have had reproductive strategies in which eggs were laid in small batches many times during the lifespan, and on the seafloor, well away from any direct effects from such a bull-eyed strike and thus survived. Many ammonite species were filter feeders, so they might have been particularly susceptible to marine fauna turnovers and climate change. There have been reliable reports of ammonite fossils from the early Paleocene. The main fossil finds have been concentrated in Denmark, the Netherlands, and the United States, with an additional possible record in Turkmenistan. However, the current fossil evidence is limited to a maximum of 200,000 years after the KPJ-PG boundary. Cultural significance. In, mid in medieval Europe, the fossilized ammonites were thought to be petrified coiled snakes and were called snake stones, or more commonly in medieval England, serpent stones. If you, if you haven't ever seen one of these, you need to Google it because they took the ammonites and they carved the little heads on the ends so they looked like coiled snakes. They were considered to be evidence for the actions of saints, such as Hilda of Whitby, a myth referenced in Sir Walter Scott's. Marmion, Ma Marmion, and St. Patrick, and were held to have a healing or oracular powers. Traders would occasionally carve the head of a snake onto the empty wide end of an ammonite fossil and then sell them as petrified snakes. In other cases, the snake's head would be simply painted on. Ammonites from the Gandaki River in Nepal are known as salagrams and are believed by Hindus to be a concrete manifestation of Vishnu. And that's the end of that article, but we still have a few minutes left, so I'm going to hop on over here to the Amolite article. And uh, Amolite is an opal-like organic gemstone found primarily along the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains in North America. It is made of the fossilized shells of ammonites, which in turn are composed primarily of aragonite, and the same mineral contained in nacre. With, with a microstructure inherited from the shell, it is one of the few biogenic gemstones. Others include amber and pearl. In 1981, amylite was given an official gemstone status by the World Jewelry Conference. The same year, commercial mining of amylite began. It was designated the official gemstone of the city of Lethbridge, Alberta in 2007. Amylite is also known as Ap Apoac is a canai for a small crawling stone. Gem ammonite, calcitine, and corite, and later, the latter is a trade name given to the gemstone by the Alberta-based mining company, Corite. Marcel Charbonneau and his business partner, Mike Beresoff, were the first to create a commercial doublets of the gem in 1967. They went on to form the Amylite Minerals Limited. Well, I was going to skip the properties of amylite, but it seems they're pretty simple, things that everybody's heard of. So the chemical properties, the chemical composition of amylite is variable, and aside from aragonite, may include calcite, silica, pyrite, or other minerals. The shell itself may contain a number of trace elements, including aluminum, barium, chromium, copper, iron, magnesium, manganese, strontonium, titanium, vanadium. Its crystallography is orthombic. Hardness is 3.5 to 4.5. And I suspected it would be softer. Ragonite is still. It's like a different flavor of calcite. All oh, very soft. So be very careful if you're handling amylite. And specific gravity is who cares? The refractive index of Canadian material is measured via sodium. But, uh huh. Mm -hmm. This is more nonsense. We don't need to hear about that. An iridescent opal like play of color is shown in fine specimens, mostly in shades of green and red. 
All the spectral colors are possible. However, the iridescence is due to the microstructure of the aragonite. Unlike most other gems, whose colors come from light absorption, the iridescent color of amylite comes from interference with the light that rebounds from the stacked layers of thin platelets that make up the aragonite. That's a very different way to get that awesome effect. Very different than opal. The thicker layers and more reds and greens are produced. The thinner the material, the thinner layers are more blues and violets predominant. Reds and greens are mostly commonly seen colors owing to the greater fragility of the inner layers responsible for the blues. When freshly quarried, these colors are not especially dramatic. The material requires polishing and possibly other treatments in order to reveal the color's full potential. Origin. Amylite comes from the fossil shells of the upper Cretaceous disc-shaped ammonites, Plasticina, nope, Plasin, Placentaceris, Mithi, the Placentaceris interclare, and to a lesser degree, the cylindrical baculite, baculites compresses. Ammonites were cephalopods that thrived in tropical seas until becoming extinct along with dinosaurs at the end of the Mesozoic era. The ammonites that form amylite inhabited a prehistoric inland subtropical sea that bordered the Rocky Mountains. This area is known today as the Cretaceous or Western Interior Seaway. As the ammonites died, they sank to the bottom and were buried by layers of benetonic mud. They eventually became shale. Many gem-quality ammonites are found within siderite concretions. These sediment sediments preserve the aragonite of the shells, preventing it from converting to calcite. Occurrence. Significant deposits of gem-quality amylite are only found in the Bear Paw Formation that extends from Alberta to Saskatchewan in Canada and south to Montana in the USA. However, small deposits have been found as far as south as central Utah, which also contain gem-quality amylite. The best grade of gem-quality amylite is along high-energy river systems in the eastern slopes of Rockies in southern Alberta. Most commercial mining operations have been conducted along the banks of the St. Mary River in an area south and in between the town of Magrath and Lethbridge. Roughly half of all amylite deposits are contained within the Canai Reserve, and its inhabitants play a major role in amylite mining. Since its founding in 1979, Quarite has operated primarily within the reservation. The company had an agreement with the Canai tribe and the Quarite playing the tribe paying the tribe royalties based on how much land and company has mined. This agreement has expired. It prohibited it prohibited the blood tribe members from surface mining along the banks of the cliffs of the St. Mary River. There were about 35 licensed blood surface miners in 2018. The surface miners are self-employed mining in all kinds of weather. Some miners also restore the fossils they find or resell their finds to other fabricators. Sorry, I'm talking really fast now because I only have a few minutes left and I think this is really interesting. The extraction. Commercial extraction is mechanized but fairly basic. Shallow open pits are dug with a backhoe and the excavated material is screened for its potential gem contents. The pits are further examined by hand. The commercial production is supplemented by the individual individuals who sell their surface picking findings to Corite and several other producers. Approximately 50% of all amylite mined is suitable for drilling. Corite is the largest miner of amylite, produces over 90% of the world's supply. The amylite deposits are stratified into several layers. The shallowest of these layers, named the K zone, lies some 15 meters below the surface and extends 30 meters down. The amylite within this layer is covered by siderite concretions and is usually cracked. This is the crushed material. It is the most common and, generally speaking, the least valuable of amylite. Beginning 20 meters below the crushed material is the blue zone. The amylite from this zone, which extends 65 meters, is usually compressed with a thin layer of pyrite rather than a siderite concretions. This is the sheet material. Due to its depths, it is rarely mined and is also much less fractured and therefore the more valuable type of amylite. As of 2015, Corite has mined over 100 acres of amylite deposits. The company employs over 280 people and accounts for approximately 90% of the world gem amylite production. Prospectors who wish to mine amylite deposits in the Crown land must apply at the Alberta Department of Energy for a lease. These leases are not regularly offered. As of 2004, there was a CAD $625 application fee with an annual rental fee of $350 per hectare. That was fascinating, but 
That's the end of everything that I put at the end of this video today. And thank you for sticking around. And thank you for trying out my tutorials. Uh, thank you for your support. I, you know, I couldn't, wouldn't keep doing this if there if people weren't coming over and checking it out. I'm really amazed. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for your support. Um, I have a few things planned in the future for, uh, let's see, I have some big round beads and uh, some uh, mermaid things and some weird S-shaped stones and we'll see what happens.